Hi, everybody. Welcome back to AI Colorado's Virtual Connect series. We've got another HSW program for you. And as always, these are complimentary for AI members here in Colorado. Today's session is called Efficient Transparency, the Evolution of Custom Glazing. Together, we will discuss how buildings today demand lower U values, bird safety, and lower embodied carbon while providing natural light and connection to the outdoors. I encourage you to use the chat box or the Q&A feature to ask questions. I'll help moderate the discussion after we hear from our panelists. In addition, as I said earlier, AIA members who stick around for the duration will earn one AIA CES Health Safety and Welfare Learning Unit for participating in today's webinar. Today, we're very pleased to have one of our premier partners with us, uh, Chris O'Hara. Welcome, Chris. And if you could turn your video on, you can see your smiling face. Hi, Chris. Hello, how are you? Good. Chris O'Hara is a professional engineer and founding principal of Studio NYL. They're a Colorado-based structural engineering and facade design studio with offices both here and in Boston and Minneapolis. Chris and Studio NYL are members of the Carbon Leadership Forum and signatories to AIA's 2030 Challenge. Chris has been a frequent presenter and panelist with the Carbon Leadership Forum, Architecture 2030, and the Boston Society of Architects on Embodied Carbon. And he's been a longtime volunteer with AI Colorado, helping us with such events as our practice and design conference and honor awards. So welcome, Chris. It's always good to see you. And we look forward to what you can share on some of the projects you're working on and some of the things you've learned in this exciting new field. Uh, we know uh, there's a lot more to it than just panes of glass. Um, it's become a technology in and of itself and how it's manufactured and used and specified by architects and engineers all over the world. So Chris, without further um, details on your program, I'll leave it to you to tell our attendees what they can learn today. Thanks. Sounds good, thank you. Let me just uh, get the screen up. So hopefully everybody's able to see the screen. Today's talk is efficient transparency and I'll explain a little bit more about how I'm gonna go about this today. Uh, really quick, Studio NYL, uh, the NY stands for New York and L is London. We have an office in neither place. Uh, I'm from New York originally, my partner Julian. And we're founded here in Boulder, Colorado um, in 2004. Um, and most people have to explain why we're in Boulder. So it's, well, because we can. Um, it's gorgeous here, it's fantastic. Um, since then we've evolved and grown quite a bit where we have uh, full studios in Boulder and Denver. And then we have what we refer to as satellite offices in Minneapolis, Colorado Springs, and Boston, which is a nice way of saying uh, we have an office space there. And when we're there, it's a functioning office. And when we're not, like in COVID, uh, Boulder and Denver are our primary homes. Although it feels like everybody in the office uh, is currently in a satellite office. Uh, we started as a structural engineering firm. Uh, so structure is pretty clear what we do. We make things not fall down, which is great. So steel, concrete, timber, you name it. Um, and I meant to have a different slide here. Uh, this is just some examples of some of our, our work in various genres. Uh, we also are a facade design firm, which I'll explain in a moment when uh, the slide gives up in the right order. But uh, our practice is growing where we practice primarily in Colorado as far as the location, but our work is all over the world. Uh, so we're really fortunate to be able to work with uh, so many great people in that regard. So the Skins Group, which is the facade side of our office, uh, began through our work with uh, structural glass initially, but an evolution where we started uh, becoming more responsible as a society, thinking about building performance in addition to how transparent can we make things. And we started uh, being told we couldn't do the things we wanted to do. So we brought in architects, people with mechanical backgrounds, people with fabrication backgrounds, so that when we get into situations where people say it can't be done, we can show them how to waterproof it, how to prove it's thermally appropriate. Uh, check for condensation potential, and then, of course, even get into the digital fabrication and how we make our systems. Uh, so the name comes from uh, just like our real skin, our building skin has very uh, much the same requirements in that it's how we look, it's how we manage temperature, it's how we manage water, it's how we manage light. All of these things are part of um, the skin. And our team is, uh, we're a smaller group, there's about 17 of us. Uh, between Boulder and Denver, and uh, you can see there's a little bit of an irreverent group uh, in our crew, and of course, structural glass is a part of who we are. So really quick, what this talk is not going to be is a bunch of catalog cuts of aluminum systems. I think we can get Connie or EFCO, whoever is your preferred curtain wall vendor, to come in 
and present on how to use their product. What we're going to do is try to get into the essence of how these systems work. And I don't mean to say that I don't like unitized cart more like uh, this particular project at 16 and Chestnut or even very complicated unitized cart These are very important parts of how we put our envelopes together. Today, we really want to focus on things that are different. Oh, mega panels, this is where we put, make a panel as big as we can fit on a truck, glass, opaque, you name it, stick systems, custom aluminum. And these are actually all stock dies now uh, from Arcadia that we're manipulating our projects throughout. Um, here you can see a T-shaped mullion. And on this project, we use that triangular shaped one, which makes the mullions just completely disappear in my opinion. Um, but that's what we're not really gonna be talking about. But I do wanna uh, start with, you know, from a performance perspective, how we look at these systems. And what you're seeing on the right is the NFRC uh, diagrams for how we calculate the system U values of our curtain wall systems. So the center of glass is where our systems can perform the best. That's you know the U, the U value we get from the glazing manufacturer. And then all these other elements are parts of our window system being the spacers, the frames, uh, where we're captured, where our structural silicon glaze, where the setting blocks are, all these different elements. And then um, we analyze these using therm, like you see some output on the left from. And then we come up with, a, for lack of a better term, like a weighted average to get the system U value for our, our, our systems. And you can see here, the blue is where our best performance is coming. So the more frame we have, the, the worse the frame performs, the worse our U value gets. So as we start to look at these, one thing I do want to talk about between curtain wall and storefront is thinking about how they're managing thermal. So even a thermally broken storefront has its challenges. We can see on the curtain wall, the thermal breaks are over to the left underneath the, um, the glass. But as you start to move the glass into the center, you see the thermal breaks on the storefront in the same place. But as you start getting in your wall systems, you're transitioning from these glazing to an opaque system, say it's a rain screen or something with appropriate outboard insulation. You can see the curtain wall is able to stack really nicely and the storefront system has a bit of a cross. So these are the kind of principles I want you to look at as we get into systems that don't necessarily use these aluminum stock systems. So we start thinking about the way windows are built. Uh, we generally have side blocks and setting blocks. So setting blocks that you see red on the diagram in the middle is what's holding the weight of our glass. Um, generally, these are located at the quarter points of the glass uh, so that we don't have to worry about any teeter-totter effect uh, by having more than two uh, elements to pick up the gravity. And that's what's going to transfer it to your framing system. The side blocks are there primarily to take your wind and seismic loads that are perpendicular to the glass. So they generally want to be a little bit softer. Normally, we're specifying 60 durometer uh, rubber for that when we're making it custom, whereas the setting blocks tend to be closer to 90 durometer. And I like showing the image on the right because this is the way we've been making windows before there was a window. It's very simple, very low tech in terms of how we can start to assemble these. So as an example, this is a house in Boulder uh, we did with uh, Pyatt Studio, where uh, it's an insulated rammed earth wall, so it's a double white wall system, and then the triple glaze glazing system sits right on top of it. And you can see in the wall section, the dashed line representing our thermal line, and then you can see the, uh, the therm uh, model for that, uh, analyzing it. But as you start to look at how this is captured, it's just a pair of simple dumb angles that flail out where the horizontal legs are moving away from the glass so that there's no metal underneath the glass uh, going inside to outside. And we're able to get that good thermal continuity that we want in our system. Um, so if we can do it with rammed earth, uh, we can probably do it with most of our wall assemblies. It's kind of the intent of these slides. Uh, but once again, trying to avoid having that come through our system. Just, of course, some shots of beautiful ram earth with triple glazing is always fun to see. Uh, and this is actually how to, an article written by Rob and uh, Will in my office about how uh, we're able to get these to work on this house in Boulder. But getting into more custom systems, many of you have probably seen us present uh, Marcus Hall before, and this will evolve. But what we did on this particular project uh, is we're working with facades that are greater than we can do with conventional aluminum systems. Even when you stuff them full of steel, trying to get them in a high wind zone like we'd have in Golden, Colorado uh, at over 30 feet. It's just not something the, uh, the millions are capable of doing. So on this particular project, to try to create the maximum transparency, we hung the millions from the roof and created uh, a situation where they're always in tension. So if you think of like uh, a rock hanging from a string, 
that weight of the rock is able to tension the string and make it think it's in tension. By being in tension, we're able to keep the mullions a little bit more slender than we conventionally could if it was in compression. If you could imagine um, taking your business card and putting your fingers on either end and pushing together, the card tries to kick out and buckle, basically. So by eliminating buckling, we're able to keep the elements a bit more slender because you take that same business card and try to stretch it, it doesn't have much of a problem. You take a lot more force. So that's the goal on this. So we're tricking the, these elements into being in tension, similar to the way you would uh, post-tension or pre-stressed concrete, where they induce a certain amount of compression in the concrete to trick it. So you see in this diagram, the red is compression, the green is tension. So when something bends, one side stretches, one side compresses. Then you put this net compression on it, and the concrete is tricked into thinking it's always in compression. With these fins, we're doing the exact same thing by hanging them from the roof. We're inducing tension into them to make them think that they're always in tension, and therefore, even when they're bending, they don't have to be governed by that buckling concern. And uh, here you can see some finished shots on it. The other thing we're doing with this particular project is we're using uh, structural silicone to adhere the glass back to the structure. Uh, what you're seeing here is a uh, silly putty. And silicone operates very similar to silly putty in the sense that under uh, short duration loads like wind impact, things of that nature, it's like the image on the right, it snaps. And it takes a lot of force to make it break. Whereas if you pull on it softly, um, like a dead load would be, or a load that never goes away, it just stretches and stretches and stretches. And as a result, you can see that the difference in strength is um, off by a factor of 10. So using structural silicone to hold glass in place, uh, to hold its weight, like as if it's taking the place of setting blocks, you'd come back in a week and that glass would be laying on the ground. Whereas for wind load, it's really quite effective. And when you look at what an SSG system, which stands for structural silicon glaze, that's essentially what they're doing, whether it's aluminum or steel, is they're using that silicone to adhere the glass to the substructure, but they are still picking up the gravity with conventional setting blocks. So as you start to look at um, this, all that load in an aluminum system is coming through that yellow you see in the diagram on the right, and we're designing it for that wind load. This is actually a slide where I taught my office how to calculate this as engineers. As architects, uh, you're not as worried about this. This is what your curtain wall supplier is supposed to be calculating. When you look at silicone, they have very strict rules about the geometries you can use in it. So on the left, you see that the silicone is the dark blue, is square to the structure that's uh, below it. So you see it on the, that left image. You can also do it straight to the side. The key is that it's at a 90 degree angle um, and always flush with what you're uh, fastening. Whereas on the right, you see it on a fillet where it's coming across on a 45. We can't get them to warranty that in the United States. So we're not permitted to use silicone in that way. Um, as you could imagine, the image in the middle becomes a bit of a challenge in that if our structure is going right through our insulating line, it is essentially a thermal bridge. So it generally leaves us with the image on the left. So to keep these mullions more slender, when we start calculating how thick the silicone needs to be, what the size of our weather joint needs to be, it starts to govern how wide uh, our structure needs to be on the inside. But nobody says it has to stay that wide. Most aluminum mullion systems are either two and a quarter, two and a half or three inches wide uh, when they're doing a structural silicon glaze. We can start to tune that based on the amount of load and how much movement we think we're gonna get in our weather joint uh, for that horizontal portion of the T in this case. And then the stem is gonna be completely governed by load. And we can adjust that depth depending on what we need it to be. So where a lot of curtain wall systems may be in the mid 20 feet range as far as their span, we can start to make these steel systems as deep as we need them to be to react to the loads that we need them to resist. And of course, um, if there's no structure going through the insulating line, it's obviously going to avoid thermal bridging and perform reasonably well. One of the things that is a bit of a misnomer is when we started looking at the thermal values for this project, and you can see it, um, it's a triple glaze system, of uh, all structural silicon glaze, so no structure coming through the facade. But for some reason, when I compare it to a really good thermally broken gasket aluminum system, the aluminum system had a better system U value, even with the same glass sizes that we were using. And intuitively didn't make sense at first. But what you need to understand is that the gaskets on a well thermally broken aluminum system are less dense than the structural silicone. And oftentimes what people try to do is make the glue line thickness of that silicone as small as humanly possible. 
So if it's the aluminum, the highly conductive material in this facade was closer to the face of glass, it doesn't perform as well. So when we start looking at our systems, here's two different analyses we did to check this in our office because we were baffled at why we're getting the value. You start to see that the green line dips a little further in uh, and closer to the aluminum uh, with the smaller silicone joint, and this is an aluminum system. And then when you start to look at uh, these gradients here, the yellow lines that you're seeing here that uh, for those of you who know therm is very, very bad to see because that means we're getting condensation potential at that point. And the only difference between these two systems is the thickness of that silicon. So the more we move the mass of uh, the structure away from the inside face of glass, the better performance we're going to get. So when you start looking at these various thermally broken aluminum systems, the ones with the bigger gaskets tend to perform a little bit better. And similarly with structural silicone, the further we're able to bring the structure back, the better the system's going to perform. So in our office, we generally try to make that uh, glue line thickness, which is the distance from the structure to the inside face of glass, uh, a half an inch uh, as a minimum. Uh, going much bigger than that tends to be unsightly and also starts to develop diminishing returns. Um, I mentioned earlier that setting blocks in a glazing system tends to be at the corner points, like you see on the image on the left. Well, we only had vertical fins on this project because when we did the analysis, we found out we didn't need horizontal mode. So we eliminated them from the project. But by doing that, we had to move the setting blocks over the corners. And just to make things a bit easier for waterproofing, we put this little cover cap on it that we're able to um, thermally isolate from the rest of the system. And you can see some of the basic details of how that came together. Thermal model, so here you can see the setting chair. get the slight uh, lip to the outside thermally, but when you look at it holistically in the system, it does quite well. And I couldn't show this project without showing the heroic cantilever that went with it. We were able to work on this with um, Bolsinski Jackson, Anderson, Mason Dale, both the structure and the facade. And uh, it's a 60 foot cantilever on this roof that tapers down to about six inches when you get to the end of the gutter. Um, wonderful illusion they created on this project with the slope of the roof relative to where you can see it from. So sorry for the structural geekdom on that. Uh, so a few years after we completed that project, um, we uh, were approached while lecturing similar to this about how far we can go with that concept. So the science building at Amherst College uh, has a similar concept to what we did at Marcus Hall, which went about 30 feet, except they wanted to go between 55 and 65 feet, depending on where you were on the building. And instead of having a fin depth that we could vary on this particular one, um, they told us they wanted to be about eight inches deep. So it became a little bit more challenging. And here you can start to see the section. Of course, uh, they also needed a canopy to be cantilevered off of it. It had uh, very ambitious uh, thermal goals. So all the glazing is triple glazed. And what we started to play with is how can we make this thing span further? How do we keep it more slender? How do we keep it more elegant? And what we started to play with is rather than having what is effectively a pin at the top and bottom of the system, we're still going to hang it to try to induce as much tension as possible. But what if we moment connect at the top and the bottom? And so what you're seeing here on the left are the bending diagrams for the 55 foot on the left and the 65 foot on the right. And you can see there's these maximum bendings that you're seeing in the green and purple at the very top and the very bottom. And it comes down to, to almost zero or through zero, I should say. And then it comes up to a, a localized high point at the mid span. So the maximum bending is actually at the top and the bottom. The problem you have with moment connecting a system is that that usually requires a lot of fasteners or welding or things of that nature. If we've locked the system in, when the roof moves with snow and wind, et cetera, we have no ability to take out that deflection. Like you think of in a normal curtain wall, you have a deflection head at the top because it's gravity um, loaded at the base. In this case, we flipped that whole thing. So now we have to be able to move at the bottom. And uh, so what you're starting to see is we have to create a slip connection that also has a uh, moment rigid rigidity to it. Uh, we couldn't get rid of all the compression in the system. So we ended up using a pair of plates and we separated them by a gap so that uh, having them a little bit further apart helped uh, enable them to deal with the buckling. And they wanted it to be a much lighter um, touch at the glass line. So we have a very small laser welded T that is able to accept the uh, structural silicone in the early concept and stitched back. And I'll talk about how that evolved from our initial concept in a little bit. But the idea is that this fin in the back would only be eight inches. Um, 
And then the way we handle the moment connection is rather than using a lot of bolts or a lot of weld, we just use two bolts. And it's using the concept of leverage. You know, you hear the idea that if I have a big enough lever, I can move the world. Same basic concept here. So rather than having a bunch of bolts that are three inches apart, we just had two big bolts that were uh, over two feet apart. And by creating that, we get this push-pull effect that is able to resist that moment. Now, at the top, it wasn't too bad because we wanted to pick up the gravity load there as well. But as we start to come down towards the bottom, it becomes a little bit more difficult because now these uh, bolts have to have vertical slots. And the whole system needs to be able to move up and down and uh, manage that movement. Now, as you could imagine, that's all great when you're just looking through glazing and there's no fire egress or challenges like that. But at some point, we do need to be able to uh, get out of the building. And I guess I'm going to get that in a minute. We did look at multiple ways of fastening the glass back to um, the structure. So on the left, you see what we did at Marcus Hall, which is just straight structural silicone. Um, the one that's boxed, which we thought was going to be the preferred system, and I just haven't moved the box to what we actually built, um, is what we call a toggle system or a cassette style system, where rather than using structural silicone straight to a substructure, we're structural siliconing to um, a small channel that we're able to adhere on in the shop under idealized conditions at waist height, um, right temperature, humidity, don't have to worry about holding the glass temporarily while the silicone cures. And then when we get out to the field, we're able to mount that with a toggle, which I'll show in a moment. Then another one was a zipper, which was more challenging than of course a capture, which architecturally was not desired. And you know, we first did this on um, Merchants Row uh, which is 26th and Champa in Denver with in situ design. Uh, this was another one we did the structure on the facade, but the glass is just toggled clamped back to um, a stock dumb piece of aluminum, not a store bought main system. And you can see this clip, we, we slide that through the glazing joint, rotate it 90 degrees and then screw it into the substructure. So that's basically how these toggle systems work. And since then, the, systems have developed in the United States. Here you're seeing uh, the Clonier uh, clear wall system. So on the left is the toggle on the inside, and then the right is a slightly more expensive uh, where they put the toggle within the, um, the glazing cavity. So right where your air cavity would be, they move the spacer blocks over a little bit and you're able to have the toggle there. Generally, it's not too much of a concern because you're gonna have a black space behind the glass anyway. So moving a the spacer with the PIB seal, which is what holds the air in your glass, um, over isn't usually that detrimental. And the other thing you'll start to notice um, with the in-glass toggle system is now we're back to a gasketed system. So if we size that gasket to be a little bit larger, we're able to get really good thermal performance from this, better so than you can get oftentimes from a pure structural silicon glaze system. So it can work very, very well, give you the butt glaze look on the outside. So in our project, uh, we did a triple glaze with uh, the toggle in the glass that you're seeing on these renderings. But uh, similar like that we talked about with the structural silicon, we still need to pick up the gravity. So you can see there's this little setting chair that comes off the steel T with a neoprene pad on it and the glass sits on that. So the gravity just rests there very, very simply. Uh, once again, we're able to get rid of horizontal mullions, but for some reason we had to add Neko shade. So all the effort to get rid of all the horizontal mullions we still ended up having a few horizontal lines to uh, support the Mecco shade because, as you can imagine, a Mecco shade over 55 feet would uh, bellow quite a bit. So we needed something to keep it in line. And I mentioned earlier uh, the challenge with hung systems and doors. So everything that you see in blue here moves with the roof. Everything in green moves with the ground because if uh, where our doors are moved with the roof, we'd have a bit of a trip hazard in a fire event if the wind uplift is kicking in. So the way we handled that is this whole canopy structure and uh, this, you can see this plate that cantilevers up from the base was welded and moment fixed to the sill. And instead of having that slotted double bolt connection right at the ground, we moved it to just above the canopy. And here you can start to see the same basic uh, arrows depicting how we're resisting the moment moved up above. But the, with the vertical arrows you see in there, we're able to move up and down. Uh, we couldn't quite get it to work as slender as we wanted to at the base connection. You can see where the dash line to create that reveal between the plates as we met the connection. So we kind of cheated and made it wider as we transitioned through the canopy. And it's always amusing to me that the canopy is much, much thicker than the entire structure for the facade. 
Um, and here you can start to see there's that blue plate that came up to um, support the double plate. So once again, you start to see that moment diagram. And with that canopy, you can see there's a big jump in our moment right at that point, which makes it a little bit more challenging to resist the bending. And here you can see it in practice. So the, the gray being the double plates that are typical coming all the way to the ground on the right, but at the canopy, you can see the black plate um, necking and moving. Uh, to make the bolts more attractive, we use pancake head uh, pins that would go through there. Uh, the ones that you see sticking out were actually erection aids uh, that would eventually be replaced with the proper one. Because on this one, the, um, the glass was so tall, since it's hanging from the roof, the amount of deflection in the roof had to be accounted for before uh, we put the glass on. So what would happen is they'd actually pull the roof down using the mullions. And then as the glass uh, was added to the system, the anchor that they used to pull the roof down actually would go uh, flack and they'd just be able to remove it and splice a new pin in. Uh, so here, once again, the movement. Uh, but as you deal with that movement, that green to blue transition on the ends comes, becomes a vertical joint. So we developed this little nested extrusion and gasketed so that we can handle that movement without failure of our air and water. Here you can see the uh, direction aid to pull the, the members down here on the pin, but our typical pins look like this. Unfortunately, when you put final finished products in while they're still doing spray fireproofing, you get these little dings that need to be cleaned up off our mullions. But um, here you can start to see it going up. Uh, and this photo I really like, this was taken um, right around noon on this building. And I'd gotten a site at 9 a.m. and there was no glass up. So the benefit of this toggle system is the glass can go up very, very fast. All these glass panels you see here, which are roughly uh, five by 10 panels, uh, they were able to get up just since I arrived at the site. Um, you don't have to wait for silicone cure. There's no temporary clamps. It, it's a really neat system, whether that toggles within the depth of the glass or on the inboard side, like the clear wall system can do. Um, and YKK makes a fitting like that. A number of vendors have that cassette style system. And here you can see the millions again from the inside getting closer to completion. Uh, one of the interesting things, of course, is we have a roof that wants a cantilever out, as well as a canopy that wants a cantilever out in some ways for shading, but also obviously for a little bit of refuge as you're coming in and out of the doors. And those are just uh, locations where thermal problems exist. So at the roof, we use an isocore detail. So these are uh, stainless steel bolts paired, uh, surrounded by insulation and some high density stainless steel in some cases to take the compression and obviously the stainless steel bolt to take the uh, tension. And they basically are used as an end plate moment connection. These plates you see here are where our mullions are hanging from. And then the one at the bottom, since this, we were able to keep the mass of steel um, a lot lighter, uh, you can see here the initial design with the isocorbs, we're actually able to get a Fabrica pad. I think I get Fabrica credit for marketing. They make their polymer uh, spacer green, so that's unsustainable. But uh, same basic idea, but it's a thinner pad. The one thing you're gonna find is as you get thinner and thinner with these pads, you, if the plate steel is directly adjacent to it's too thick, you can get some condensation potential there. So it's really important that we're doing the thermal analysis on these elements to be sure um, that we don't develop that condensation on the interior side. Whereas the isocore, we're actually getting um, a U value through that connection. So this one's more about, um, avoiding condensation potential and significant thermal loss, where the other one's actually acting very similar to a, an insulated line. And then here's some shots of the finished. Uh, there's all kinds of other stories about seismic, which I'm not gonna get into right now, but you start to see the breadth and scope of this. As you can imagine, these fingers that come out through our facade uh, all move at a different frequency than the rest of the building. So movement joints were a bit of a challenge, I guess, but that's a story for another day. Some more shots of the mullions finished. And um, these often the term if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So getting the data on these buildings and how they perform is critical. And uh, this is our first coat top 10 award winning project. So we're very excited that uh, Payet had us along to go work on this. And um, hopefully in another talk, we'll be able to talk about the weathering steel facade too, which is all kinds of other fun. But some of these systems obviously are a little more expensive than we get on an everyday project. So as we come back and look at that st standard aluminum system, where is all the work really being done in terms of what we care about from an air, water, thermal standpoint? 
and that is all going to be to the left of this dash red line, what we call the intelligence. Everything to the right is just a dumb box. It's structure. So you can make that structure anything we want. So what if we just bought that part on the left that's doing all the work? And most manufacturers refer to that as a veneer extrusion. This is something we do quite often. Um, so Charleston International Airport, uh, hurricane zone, high seismic zone. Um, it was a, a reclass portion of the building as well as some uh, new gates that were added. And the span was roughly 32 feet. So significantly high wind loads, more than we can ever do in an aluminum system. You can see it from the outside. And the way we did this was with ladders of, of uh, steel that we could then stitch together where they made it to develop the system. And here you start to see the steel uh, coming together. But by doing this and then just mounting on that veneer extrusion, we're able to make the system much more efficient. And here you can start to see some diagrams from another project about how these ladders mount. So you've got half of the mullion that you've kind of seen highlighted here in blue coming out with uh, this ladder for half of two different mullions, so the left side and the right side. And then you start bringing them in, you stitch them into the connections, um, and you bring the next one in, and now you're forming your full mullion. But rather than one thick plate, we're using a pair of plates similar to like we did on Amherst. But uh, in this case, we're just doing it to help unitize the system. Uh, on, this, on the project that these diagrams came from, we actually used a cassette concept to structurally silicone to an angle rather than a channel. And then the angle would come in and then just be bolted. So the ladders would go up first, and then the glass would come in and just be screwed into the steel uh, very simply on the other project which I'll show you some finished shots in a minute. So here you can see the assembly diagrams of how these pieces come together. So this is at the Tech in Monterey, project we do with Sasaki. Um, once again, another heroic 60-foot cantilever, but the, the facade mounting to it was really quite simple. And here you can see some more shots of that building. But the veneer extrusion concept we're using all over. Um, Ralph Carr Justice Center, same basic idea of that veneer part of the aluminum system mounted to a steel fin. In this case, we ran it horizontal and hung the horizontal fins from the roof and, of course, curved it. We can go with crazy geometry if we want, like we did on Liverpool and Sorrentes. The Cineteca project took the same concept, but on a skylight. But once again, you just take that top part, and then you mount it, uh, in this case, to a pair of angles, which we could buy very cheaply. And uh, we have our, our facade system. The thing to really think about with these two is aluminum's elasticity, in other words, how much it flexes and moves, it's going to move three times as much as steel. So when I come up with a comparable amount of steel to aluminum, it's going to be a shallower, smaller section. Uh, the aluminum is technically lighter, but the steel is uh, more rigid. And then the other thing we did on Finitech, I took the idea of like matting a photograph, like with the soccer photo from a target uh, frame. That's what we did on Finitech. So we, the look was just trying to do a pattern you'll see in a moment. We just had a dumb skylight over the top that's all rectangular and underlaid the matting, and we have this descending pattern of triangles that are able to form the pattern that was desired by the architect. And of course, the shadows on the ground was the money shot they were going for. Um, use the same concept with curved glass. This is more about uh, computation design when I normally present this, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick. The architect came to us with this wonderful curvy design, and uh, we couldn't afford it. Curved glass is too expensive, so we uh, ran some grasshopper scripts on this to try to optimize the glass. Never changing the curve, but just change how we picked it up. So wherever you see uh, the red in these diagrams on the left is the initial geometry. Uh, that's the expensive ver version of curved glass. So we're hot bending the glass as opposed to, as opposed to cold bending it. As you move to the right, same exact curvature, but we retessellated the structure, just the patterns. And you can see there's a lot less red in this. And it got to the point where it was affordable for the uh, project. And there's a whole different study. You can see a lot of these are actually listed as flat. They just appear to be curved just because of the subtleness of how gentle the slope was. So there's curved, uh, hot rolled, there's curved, cold rolled, and then there's effectively flat. And we did the same basic mullion concept, double plates that we can then uh, easily cut with a water jet, which I'll show in a moment, and then mounted the veneer extrusion to it. And these are the diagrams we use to help sell the contractor that this is not an expensive system. Trying to show it as a kit of parts type of idea of how these pieces come together. So the idea that we can just water jet cut aluminum or plasma cut steel to create these kinds of geometries. And then we have the veneer extrusion, since it's so slender, we're able to roll that more readily um, using conventional bending methods. We're trying to bend 
a mullion that's designed to span 30 feet is going to be really difficult. Um, and so you can see the, some of the precedent imagery for uh, the veneer extrusions. And then here's where the project stands now. It's actually going up. Um, I just got these photos this morning. Unfortunately, all the cool curve glass isn't quite on yet, but it's getting there. Um, we've done this for retail. And once again, the point is these are not expensive systems. When you look, this is the building before we got here. We're renovating a Sears and trying to turn it into a Primark. And you can see they're not exactly going crazy next door with the big sporting goods. These are systems that can be made very affordable. In this case, we're spanning nearly 40 feet for the Primark uh, facade and even integrated in uh, LED screens into the facade system. Um, Crested Butte Performing Arts Center is all based on these bit, uh, concepts but using structural silicone for both these uh, more rectangular bits as well as these slope bits. Uh, we can put the fins on the outside like this house in Aspen. And now at DIA for these taller nodes at uh, concourses B and C, we're using that concept, whereas the rest of the systems are more you normal unitized current wall system. And you see it coming together, once again, uh, being very careful with our bolts and how we countersink them with male, female to try to keep them attractive. But it starts to show you just how slender these things start to look, even on a very, very tall facade. And it's all about that intelligence and structure, which also can work with other substrates. It doesn't have to be steel. It could be anything. Believe it or not, we've even done this once with a glass tin packet, which seems ludicrous to do, but that's the way it was done. One of the things we're seeing a lot of is aluminum is a high embodied carbon material. So trying to replace it with something with a lower embodied carbon uh, budget is always great. So, and not to mention that having a beautiful material like a glue lamb member is always uh, something we're looking to do. There are a number of tested systems out there by like Shuko and Reiko. This moment you're seeing here is Reiko. Uh, so it's a veneer extrusion. You can once again see there's a gasket. They have an SSG version that uses a toggle with the glass to uh, mount it back to the system. But we can just use a standard con here if we want to and just screw it in. Um, I meant to have an image in here, but we even did this with the Colorado um, OCU Denver's uh, design build program at Sign Build Bluff. If the students can build one of these systems with a wood backup system and veneer curtain wall, there's no reason our contractor shouldn't be able to do it. Um, here's an example. Um, it's called Dudley Public Library on this slide, but it's actually the Roxbury Library now because they renamed it. But the joinery starts to become critical. H having these concealed connections of our uh, mullion, horizontal mullion and vertical mullion connections. And uh, here you can see it completed. And uh, once again, that joinery, how it comes together, it's just so important to keep it elegant and beautiful. And some more shots. Sorry, I'm a bit of a geek for this project. It's very exciting to see it happen. And we're doing a lot more of these systems now. There's oh, some reason I am I got booted off the slideshow. Um, when you guys um, finish this, I'm going to make these slides available. These are some uh, slides from one of our projects uh, in Cambridge right now, looking at different million options. It's in quick. Am I still here, Mike? I think I'm showing. I just saw a Zoom quit come up. So if no. anybody knows better. All good. We're good? Okay. Not sure why it's doing that. Anyway, there's a number of different uh, mullion geometries that we've developed for that project for a variety of conditions. Um, and, I'll, and I will make sure you guys have this. So varying spans and different mullion geometries. Gosh, getting driving crazy. We got your video, but not your audio. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. So the last thing we saw were, were those 15 foot spans in your PowerPoint. You got it. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why Zoom hates me right now. It's okay. I will get back to it. So anyway, um, I'm not going to dwell on the exact span, the depth ratio, all these sections. Um, I'll give an email at the end, or you can go through um, AIA, and we'll make sure you have this as a reference. You can use all the slides for that matter. Um, but you start to see these relative to each other of what we're dealing with, starting with you know, stock aluminum on the extreme left to some of those custom mullion sizes. I showed uh, aluminum shapes, I mean, on, on that on the other two on the left and then going to steel to wood to even a glass spin and what these things start to look like 
and then max spans for different member sizes. And this is kind of what we did for the project. Also some pros and cons of these veneer systems if you're interested. Um, similar to the veneer system is a technology we've been um, working to develop with a company called Framark. And um, the first time we used it is on this um, wonderfully evil looking building um, in uh, North Carolina, this is at West Carolina University, back when it was always all cool to do a lot of black spandrel glass on a project. Um, it, this building leaks in every way you could imagine. Um, air, water, energy, all of it. Uh, so we are we we're tasked with adding some structural modifications as well as reclouding the building. And rather than rip this whole facade down, all the aluminum, throw it in a landfill and put a new facade on, we started trying to think, how can we salvage as much of this as possible? The glass is shot, so unfortunately we do have to get rid of that. But how can we save the aluminum? And what most people don't realize is glass and aluminum are not uh, as recyclable as bottles and cans are. When we start adding low E coatings to glass, it makes it to a point where we can't recycle it easily. Aluminum, once it's anodized, uh, gets to the point where it can't easily be recycled. So oftentimes these things that we think of intuitively just due to what we buy at the store as being recyclable aren't. So uh, this is the vision for the project from the architect. And we said, well, let's use the existing mullion since it's not thermally broken and it, it would leak thermally even after we put new gasket seals and proper IGU on it, it's still gonna be a thermal problem. It's gonna have condensation problems. So this yellow you see here is a fiber reinforced polymer protrusion that the intent was to slide this over the mullion and mount it to that and use the mullion to do all the structural work, the dumb box work that it was doing before and add to it a new intelligence. And you can see it's even got the ability to accept a cover cap with a screw boss just like an aluminum mullion would. Um, the difference is the fiber reinforced polymer is one eight hundredth the thermal conductivity of aluminum. Because let's face it, we use aluminum for cookware. It is made to move energy. And unfortunately we're using it in our facade. Um, there's a lot of great benefits to aluminum in terms of how we can extrude it to accept gaskets and screws and things like that, which makes it ideal for facades. But from a thermal standpoint, it's absolutely horrible. So by adding this um, veneer over the top of it, we're able to thermally isolate the inside face of glass. And as I started talking about earlier, you notice this inside face of glass is even further from the aluminum than the structural silicone and gasket, it's just as we showed earlier, which is awesome. It makes it perform even better. Uh, the downside of this is now I just push the glass further away from the mullion. In other words, the dead load of the glass is trying to put more bending into the mullion. So we had to go and reanalyze all the structure to make sure it was still adequate. You're going to see some of the thermal models um, using the, the Alpen Windows uh, glass product initially with some of our thoughts, but uh, their thermal ambitions weren't as high as ours initially. Uh, but one of the challenges we ran into is the archive data uh, didn't fully take into account the VE efforts on this building we weren't aware of. And it was actually an inside glazed storefront system, not a curtain wall system like we thought it was. So what you're seeing now is this extrusion ends up looking much more like our original veneer. And we just screwed it into the cover cap. And you can see here, these old gaskets are where the glass used to be captured. And then this clip in to interior glaze it. So we then had to cover the mullion to make it look beautiful again. So here you can see the glass installed. This bit right here is where the glass uh, used to be captured and we moved it out. So as we look at this diagram, so the cyan is just the big dumb structure. The um, I don't know, this pinkish orange, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at colors um, of the eight, eight color Crayola box. That's where the glass used to be captured. And then the green, green for sustainability is where our new thermally inert protrusion exists, screwing into that and giving us the ability to capture the glass um, effectively. So this was sold not because of the embodied carbon uh, benefits. It was sold because it was cheaper. That's how we convinced them to do it. And whenever we're trying to uh, move the needle on doing buildings and being better for the environment as we approach the 2030 challenge or destructions in years 2050, we always have to make that economic argument. Uh, so it's very, very critical to it. So here you can see, um, these are all the fiber reinforced polymer protrusions, um, not marketed as well, so they're not green like some of the other stuff was. And then some other uh, fiber reinforced polymer angles and stuff that we're using here. And then of course, all the gaskets will eventually slide in. Um, and here you can see it up, uh, the glazing system. We create an opaque assembly up above, uh, which 
once again, we're like, why not reuse the mullion? So we just ran hat channels, mullion to mullion, used a, a better marketed uh, thermally uh, fiber reinforced polymer, Zegert, which is a, a smart CI. It's the manufacturer of that particular project, but a bunch of outboard mineral will to create a proper rain screen on the outside of this building um, and drastically change the way this building performs. We're going from a spandrel glass condition to a true rain screen. Uh, it's a night and day difference thermally. And we're going to be doing something very similar at the Buell Theater. Uh, they're going to be on site with us any day now. Shop drawings are already approved. Um, so all the glazing that you see here will be removed and replaced, and we'll be slotting over the existing mullions uh, with that same kind of polymer concept. Uh, all those mullions have been back analyzed, verified if you take the capacity, and uh, I'm very excited to see this happen uh, very close to home in Denver. And here's some, just some shots from the drawings, taking the archive information on the left, turning into the new details on the right. Uh, these are the one section on the left side and the plan details on the right. But these, uh, these protrusions are all developed in a way that we can make them to these models. So I talked about transparency. So I'm gonna shift gears again and go to more transparent rather than stick built systems and start with cable walls. Um, you know, my first cable wall that I did was before I moved to Colorado. This is the Kimmel Center by Rafael Vignoli in uh, Philadelphia, where this entire end wall is hung from the barrel vault roof with cables and then just dumb weights at the bottom. And uh, this particular wall, I think, maxes out at 90 feet tall. And so as you look at the diagram of this, the green represents tension, and then the red is the barrel vault. And I can't quite see it because of what um, Zoom does with my screen, but I'm gonna get that away. you can see the cable goes from being straight up and down. And when the wind blows, it forms a catenary shape. And it lifts the weight a little bit. That catenary shape, the horizontal component of that is what's actually resisting the wind load. So um, it's using deflection to try to convert that component, the horizontal component into the very subtle horizontal element of that uh, cable curvature. Um, but generally by code, uh, at least for, from the Glazing Association of North America, we're allowed to get these systems to span, um, I'm sorry, deflect, uh, amount equal to uh, their span divided by 40. So a 40 foot tall wall can deflect a foot. That's a lot, <laughs> it's, a, it's an exceptional amount. So detailing these systems to manage that, manage the seals is critical. Because what you'll find is uh, oftentimes when we start tuning these systems, the deformation of the silicone and how it meets the jam condition, how it meets these various conditions around the building, start to determine the tension we actually need in it. And so what may seem counterintuitive is these super long cables in the middle, since they're not up against anything rigid, actually have the least amount of pre-stressing. We can let this move as much as we want. When we get here towards the end and the cable's shorter, but this red bit isn't moving at all, that we have to get the most amount of tension to uh, try to control that deflection so it doesn't move as much. And I, I put this in here to remind me because I always got to remember the math. If you took that 40-foot wall put 20 pounds a square foot of wind load, which is a very low wind load, allowed it to deflect a foot, the tension in that cable is 20,000 pounds. So just think about that for a moment. All these cables each have at least 20,000 pounds in them, and then you have to have a surrounding structure to resist that. So it's always something that becomes a bit challenging. Here you can see the wall. Um, on this one, since we had a lot of stuff coming on underneath, we just hung the weights rather than anchoring it to a floor system, and that's laterally braced by the mullions of the skylight, believe it or not. So the skylight actually pivots a bit. It's on hinges on either end. Uh, so it, it's able to resist the horizontal loads, but doesn't pick up any vertical load. And here you can see those weights. Um, I was always annoyed that they weren't more scary, but you don't realize these are just massive lead blocks on this project. Uh, they should say like Acme, like they're in a um, Roadrunner cartoon and they're gonna fall on the coyote. That's what I thought they should do. So to deal with these deflection challenges, uh, most cable walls you see are nets. So this is from Jazz at Lincoln Center, project I did help do some concepts for with Vignoli, where the cables are running both vertically and horizontally because that catenary curve comes to zero when you get to the jams, as well as the heads, um, and you're able to start to tune that system deflection-wise. The challenge is all the perimeter structure around us now has all these tension values coming in. So even though you can get these walls relatively cost-effectively, uh, per square foot of glass, the structure around it may end up costing more than the facade. So we're always thinking about how we tune that structure when we deal with these systems. 
So uh, coming to one closer to home, uh, 16 chestnuts, so you can see the Millennium Bridge in the background there, is uh, a vertical only cable wall, just because we, as it turned around this lobby, we just didn't have the ability to anchor these cables in a way to take a horizontal tension out. And so we had to take all of that load at the top and bottom. But uh, of course the clamp um, in modern world, I guess we don't do spider fittings anymore, which I think is fantastic. I'm kind of tired of spiders. So a very simple clamp, setting blocks of the glass are hidden in this clamp. And then that's how we get the um, wind loads. So there's also side blocks in this clamp that transfer the load back to the cable. So as we start to look at uh, the system, there are a couple of challenges. Um, predominantly the area where the doors are, just like it was on Marcus Hall and um, the Amherst project, as well as the corners. Because if we're letting these cables deflect a lot, how are we gonna be able to manage those seals? Because those places are gonna effectively be rigid. They're not gonna move as flexibly as the cables permitted to move. So we have to start tuning the facade. So here you can see as we come from the edge of the door, how the system's deflecting because the doors can't leave in from the ground. And then you get this deflection of the cable coming back. And this is obviously just done as simple grass. It's not showing the actual catenary curve. It's being a little bit more simplistic in the analysis, but showing those maximum movements and how we're tuning the silicone to do it. So the elements you see circled in red are what we refer to on this project as the high tension cables, which I think were around 96 kips of tension in them. Whereas the blue ones were more about 30, 40 kips of tension in them because they were permitted to move a little bit more. And here we also, of course, have to check uh, the glass as it's starting to warp and deform to deal with that stress. But most importantly, if the studies in these joints, you can see the subtle movements of this glass. So this dash circle here is where the cable starts. And then when there's wooden suction, this is where the cable moves to in these drawings. So as we start to look at these deflected shapes, we're checking the captures. We're checking how much the silicone is elongating and making sure that either our gaskets or silicone can handle it. Um, and not uh, lose air and water in the process. And that's actually what ends up governing us more than anything else, is those elements of reflection, you know, whereas the, the, we're, we're permitted to move over a foot on this wall, but as you can probably, if you were able to zoom in or when you come back later, these deflections are closer to four inches, which is still enormous for a facade, but um, it's definitely tuned down to accommodate the bend. So here's a slight fold in the facade over here, the hard corner, and of course, the, um, the doors. The next way we play with transparency is just getting rid of the structure altogether and stealing ideas from, you know, simple, dumb base shoe. And we were cleverly refer to these as base shoe systems I'm gonna get into, where we're able to create a moment connection, much like we talked about on Amherst, that these base shoes for cantilevered handrails create moment connections in glass. So why not use them in facades? We use them for the shelving systems at a the Denver Art Museum gift shop with Roth Shepard of tricking the system and having this fixed moment connection base. And of course, also did it to create the shelves. Uh, but what happens when we want to do this for a facade? And unfortunately, insulated glass units aren't nearly as friendly as handrails and interior glass walls. So we have to worry about the air cavity and that PIB seal, which is what holds the air inside our IGU and keeps it the hermetically sealed unit, can't really handle the extra compression that would come from burying it in the base shoe like this. So what we do is we, um, laminate one of the, the lights of the IGU and make that a little bit longer than the system and bury it into that CR Lawrence uh, handrail base because you know, CR Lawrence is like the Kmart of glass fitting. We can afford these things. They're actually uh, reasonable. You can see here on the right, the moment diagram for the system. You get this maximum moment in the glass at the bottom, goes through zero, and there's another localized maximum and then pinned at the top. If there are any engineers here wanting to heckle, they would tell me that I didn't actually change the moment in the glass at all. It's actually the exact same bending if it was just a dumb span with a pin at the bottom. The difference is the way the glass moves. So as you look at it, you can see at the top with being a pin connection, just kind of pivots back and then rotates into that a parabolic curve. Whereas the bottom, it comes up straight a little bit and has this reverse bending before it goes into that standard curve. By managing the deflection this way, we can get this, the glass to span about 35% further and still see the same stress in the glass. And by doing that, it makes it a lot easier to start eliminating mullions from our system. And then the color diagrams here are stress analysis for the Jackson Airport that we do at Gensler. So over here, you can see just a, a big open space, but the money shot was really above the baggage claim. Here's where the bags come in. 
and then uh, the clear span glass above it there, you can see reflecting the Grand Tetons, uh, overall shot, and of course the inside shot. So all these bags coming out from underneath and voluminous glass system up above uh, was great fun. It's a beautiful structure that uh, unfortunately we would not do on this particular project for the primary structure. But we use this a lot. Uh, this is a house in uh, Trails Village um, in Denver where the master bedroom here is a mullionless glass system. Um, this is a Denver club, you can see it coming in. And I like showing this particular detail because you can see the exterior insulation coming over the, the plaza, up the base shoe and underneath the glass because you know, those C.R. Lawrence base shoes are made out of aluminum, highly conductive, bad thermal material. So we want to keep that completely on the inboard side of our insulating line. So we're tracking that down and around it. Um, to show that we're not the craziest people out there, uh, this is not one of our projects. My old boss in New York, uh, Tim McFarland, designed this. Where he did the same basic concept at 24 feet. Uh, the Broad Museum in LA does the same thing. A lot of the Apple stores are doing the same trick now. You can see here that um, the glass is subtly thicker. Um, the Jackson Airport and all the ones in Denver actually used uh, the, the laminated light was two quarter inch um, lights of gla tempered glass with a century glass inner layer. And then the, um, the light on the other side of the air cavity was uh, just a quarter inch light. Here, if you look at this on the Kieran Timberlake project, the total thickness of glass on this is about two inches plus the air cap. So a lot of glass. Um, this is one of the projects we're doing uh, this system on right now. Um, this one will go about 22 feet. We've got two other ones that'll be in excess of 20 feet. 15 footer and an 18 footer in design right now. Um, now, one of the studies on this that was a bit interesting is as the glass gets thicker and thicker, they don't make handrail bases for inch and a half thick glass. So, or inch thick, uh, inch and a quarter thick glass. They do go up to an inch. And uh, we decided to bury it in a slightly deeper shoe, grout fix it. We wanted to study which way is it better to set this glass. And a lot of it has to do with the constructability. The image of Denver Club I showed earlier. The thinner light is actually on the outside, so we can get the insulation under it a little bit easier. Instead of using aluminum here, we're using steel as the base shoe. But one of the things you start to look at, and for those of you who've done big expanses of glass, you generally want the thicker light of glass on the outside. Because as we go through uh, seasons of uh, thermal changes, the air cavity inside your IGU, air is going to expand and contract depending on what the temperature is. So as it gets hotter, that air is going to try to swell and it's going to push whichever the least rigid piece of glass is out and it's going to bow and it can start to get a little bit of a, a funhouse look in terms of how it reflects light. So on the outside is usually where it's an issue from a light reflection standpoint. So we want this thicker glass on the outside. And so we were wondering like how bad is it going to be if we do that? Here you can see the thermal diagrams for this wall with the thinner on the outside versus the thicker on the outside. And it actually ended up being reasonably comparable. Our system U value isn't quite as good but when you think about this system, you think about that NFRC method of calculation of those weighted averages. We only have this condition along the sill of the glazing system where a piece of glass is 24 feet tall. And um, the, whole, the joints between them are actually on eight feet on center. So when you start thinking about our best performance on that glass is the center of glass and the edges are where we start to get less. And then of course this base shoe and then, well, the head detail is the next worst. And then the worst of all of them is this base shoe thermally. If we're able to get this dialed in where it's not that bad, most of this stuff is going to perform quite well because we have so much of our center of glass building that uh, average. The challenge we run into is these are big, heavy pieces of glass, and how we install them is critical to um, whether or not we can actually afford them. A lot of those base shoe systems we've done in the Denver area, we've gotten around $105 a square foot to get them built. Some of these super big ones could be up to $300 a square foot, so not always within our budget. So how we design the building around them starts to save a lot of money very fast because the material isn't that bad in cost perspective. It's the labor to install them. So thinking about how the glass is going to come into place and come into our rough opening. Because if you think about it, with that extension of the glass into the base shoe, our, our daylight opening is actually significantly smaller than the size of glass. So we have to develop the system to be able to accept the glass as it comes in. And so to help put bidders at ease, we developed some of these diagrams uh, to show how that comes in. So we have a, a removable piece on the outside of the base shoe. So instead of being that monolithic Sierra Lawrence, you have an angle that we can bolt in. 
and then the glass is going to come and fold in, and then another mountable piece on the outside. And then we could start bringing in a, a, a rain screen that cantilevers down to cover up the system later. And how that all comes together, then eventually hiding the base shoe and the paver system. So it starts to go away a little bit. And here you can see that the final detail we're using on the Reagan project, which um, is going into shop drawings right now. And here you can see the, um, the angle that's removable here that's highlighted in green to really make it easier to um, install this glass and also enables us to keep the interior floor up a little bit higher. But these kind of thoughts and studies are critical to how we develop these systems. Um, next, I'm going to start getting into how we treat the edge of these systems. Uh, this particular element you got, I got highlighted here is what I, we refer to in our office as a scuba mask, where we cleverly take the glass and push it much further out than our insulation line of the rain screen around it. So this is, you know, a very normal rain screen system with all outboard mineral oil insulation. Uh, we, we do have, uh, since there's a lot of openings that we could see through, we did have an additional vapor permeable barrier. So we would be looking at mineral oil all the time. And then this window with the center of glass way out here, this is where our center of insulation is. So how do we get back to where our insulation is without making this big and ugly, but still be something we can afford? So the dash red line you're seeing here is our thermal line. Um, the blue is our air and water control layers. Uh, and we were just using a simple aluminum system on this one. So there's a steel element that can levers out, but that in itself is, is a conductive element. You can see there's not enough room here to put four inches of mineral wool over that. So how do we get around it? And this yellow that you see here is an aerogel uh, blanket that we're getting about a little over R9 per inch, depending on who makes it. Um, we used to, Dow used to make one as the HPI 1000. It's no longer in production, but we have three other manufacturers now to make this. When we did this project, it was a, a Dow product. Uh, but this uh, felt is, you know, kind of our get out of jail free card on tricky uh, thermal conditions as we trans make these transitions. And on this particular uh, project, we use two layers of it. The felt comes in about three eighth inch thicknesses. So we have three quarters of an inch of insulation there. Um, and we're doing reasonably well on that. Um, so what does that come to that, uh, you know, on R15. And you can see the, the, um, the analysis of that, what we're really worried about here, rather than overall performance of the system, is making sure we don't have condensation potential. That was really the goal on this particular project. And then you could see the scuba mask. Once again, we did something very similar to this with students, also at Design Build Block. Uh, so uh, kudos to Rick Sommerfeld and his teams there. Um, other edges that always come up, this is uh, the Altmire project. This is a GSA project, last, you name it. So you can see the before and after of a uh, reclad on this project. But uh, this project was so chronic. Everything was about the detail and the edges, the reveals. Uh, and they had to be elegant. So when you come up to the parapet, it's always a challenge, like how we keep this parapet a top of parapet insulated, but ultra thin. And you can see here how we're necking down the geometry and using um, this uh, Dow blanket again to try to um, get some insulation over that. But more importantly is rather than using the steel plate like we're using before, what these, this image you see here, those are actually fiber reinforced polymer shapes made by a company called Strongwell. Um, it's nearly as strong as steel in the strong axis, but unfortunately we always end up using it in the weak one, which gives it about 10 to 12,000 PSI. So let's um, call it about half as strong as steel uh, for creating these diving board conditions. But it is, uh, compared to steel, it's about uh, 170 times less thermally conductive than steel. So we're able to do the thermal analyses on these conditions and really uh, get them to perform a bit better. So here you can see the diving board coming out. Um, if you're looking on Strongwell's website, the x 525 is um, a product that can resist uh, the NFPA requirements from fire uh, standpoint. So that's generally what we're specifying. There are other people like Armatherm and Fabrica who make similar type products, but um, Strongwell, similar to C.R. Lawrence, it's kind of a Kmart of these systems, so we tend to get them a little bit cheaper from them. Um, we also use the same thing on a serrated wall here. This project's not quite built yet, but it's the same idea. Uh, we have the serrated wall system, tricking it to be thinner at the edge and getting aluminum away from the system using a corner dart instead of a vertical million. But that same Dow blanket starting to come in to these transition zones on the serration to um, help protect the aluminum side uh, from having thermal make it fat. 
I obviously very clearly didn't do anything with structural glass. That's I'm way late already. It looks like I'm uh, over an hour. So that's over an hour on its own. But I did want to talk about what's coming next in the industry. And the one I'm very excited about thermally is vacuum insulated glass. Not quite on the market yet. Uh, I probably can't tell all the stories I've heard about where they are in development and production just due to some NDAs. But when you start to look at um, this glass at a quarter inch thick, six millimeters you see over here, it is drastically outperforming triple glaze. So you start looking at uh, different double glaze and triple glaze systems and their, system, uh, their center of glass U values between air and argon and how they're, they're getting better depending on how many room side low E coatings we have, which adds money and reflectivity that we don't want necessarily. And even going to quadruple glaze, which I have never in real life seen a quadruple glaze system, getting all the way down to these low U values. And then we um, start adding in the framing system and those all jump a little bit because the frame obviously makes the performance worse in the center of glass. And then we compare these to vacuum insulated glass and with the framing system. And you can start to see that the circle is relative to the dash, which is a center of glass value, and then the green circle here is relative to the frame system. They are drastically better than quadruple glaze. So when this comes on the market, it's going to be a game changer. I'm not sure which manufacturer is going to get it first. I don't have a, a horse in the race. I just want it on the market so we can use it. Especially when you start thinking about re, re, uh, using existing mullion systems, that we can have an uninsulated glass wall system slide on that polymer protrusion and then mount on a piece of glass that's only a quarter inch thick. So it weighs the same as the glass that's already there. It's game changer as far as what we can do. Um, the other one I just think is cool, and this isn't really what's next so much as this is already here. Um, this is a mitered insulated glass corner uh, made by Agnora out of Canada. They, they're one of the suppliers that gets a lot of our oversized glass. But it was actually developed at a necessity because this butt glaze corner, they couldn't actually access it due to where the column was and the interior stuff was located. And they developed this mitered corner. And I just got to say, it's cool. So uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to. So thank you for putting up with me and letting me go along. Anybody got questions, I can stick around as long as I'm permitted by AIA to, mm -hmm. Or you can reach out to me at the email here and shoot questions. Uh, I could send you PDFs of the slides. Uh, all kinds of good fun. So um, thank you, Brenda and Mike, and uh, have at it if you have questions. Well, you certainly didn't drag it out. Are we doing those through a chat? How does that work? Put too many pauses in there. It was just chock full of content. Um, so we'll just open it up to people who are, who are here on the call. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or um, use the Q&A function, and we'll make sure Chris gets those. Um, I suspect, though, that people. I know still, it was a bit of a fire hose, but there's a lot to share. Still processing everything that, that they uh, took. On. <laughs> I was really, uh, you know, the question that I had, well, several, because I'm, I feel like I'm getting a, a taste of a material science degree just listening to you here. But um, is, what are clients responding to? And you kind of address that a little bit with that Western Carolina project. Is that, you know, the Cost is always a factor. It's not just the, the performance or the look or the technology um, or even the environmental benefits. It, it has to pass yeah. out so, for a lot of these clients too. So for us, I mean, our role on projects, whether we're the structural engineer or the facade designer with the architect, is we're the enablers for you guys. Um, you know, when you have a vision for a project and the challenges and the ambitions, whether that's aesthetic or thermal or cost, whatever the, they are, you know, we're kind of that technical resource that gives you the, the kind of parts and tools to try to solve that. So inevitably at some point, the vision is going to come into contact with constructability or budget or performance. Needs. And we're always trying to work with this kind of parts mentality of how do you assemble these things using elements that people are actually comfortable with that are going to build our system and therefore make it cheaper. Um, to get what the goals we have in the project are. And that's that's always the challenge of it is understanding exactly what the design wants it to be and how to merge that with the economic realities. Because if we can't meet the performer, it won't get built. Um, one of the sayings in our office is renderings don't count. So in other words, if it's a rendering at the end of the day, that means we couldn't get it built. And uh, that means we failed on some level. So 
that's that's always got to be a, a topic of it. And, you know, as we're trying to have other goals, like in buy carbon, as an example, I have to make the economic argument while I'm doing it. Otherwise, um, it's only going to work when I have that great benefactor like an Apple to let me do something. And that, unfortunately, I don't know how it is for everybody else on this call. I don't get those benefactors very often. <laughs> Most of these projects you see actually have relatively modest budgets. And it's how we're able to manipulate the systems to look the way they're intended or look complex while still being simple is uh, the goal on many of these projects. Well, if, if you get the impression that Chris has a lot more to share with us, uh, you're right. And we are planning to do some deeper dive content later this year. Uh, we're working on a, on a retool series that really gets into these issues of embodied carbon and environmental stewardship uh, on more than just an introductory level. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, stay tuned for, for what's coming on that realm. Uh, we also next week have a se seminar on our honor awards call for entries, which will launch on May 5th. And the week after we have uh, decarbonization and open invitation. Um, same time, same place, uh, all, also HSW, um, you know, for on our behalf of AI Colorado, I want to express our thanks to Studio NYL for their presentation day and their long-term support. And, uh, you know, I know when I met Chris and Julian, they said, we love working with architects and thinking about their crazy ideas. So keep them coming and uh, you'll see how they get. They're not crazy. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can tell us how crazy they are and whether they're buildable. Thanks, everybody, for joining us Thanks. today. Uh, have a great rest of the week. And cheers, Chris. And we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Sorry I ran a little long. No problem. Take care, everybody.